or else why are we even doing this? If I don't think I cut out with the fun stuff, because that to me is the fun stuff. Build that audience, because if you've got no one to sell it to, then it's just going to flop and die. And no one likes a floppy, right? I'm yet to meet a woman who just kind of grew up confidently in her body. Welcome to my podcast. I'm Nicole Brumner. Join my weekly conversations with really interesting people as I delve into the stories and experiences that make them uniquely them. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. I have missed this. I've really missed these live podcasts. So I hope that um, you enjoy this return of this format. Today I'm here with Ido. And as I've put across all my socials lately, Ido puts together this fantastic tracking document or tracker, which he's going to explain a bit more uh, about that now. And I thought it would be really interesting to have a regular monthly slot every time he releases this tracker, which delves into the data and actually deciphers the data and, and talks about what is actually happening to house prices because the num numbers don't lie, do they? So, Edel, thanks very much for joining me. My very first question is, what is the tracker that you produce every month? Yeah, so hi, Nicole, and hello, everyone. Yeah, so we created something called the Property Index Tracker, and uh, just to set the scene, we are um, set up as a property buying agency. Um, a lot of clients, uh, when we hear in the media uh, information about the, um, the state of the housing market in the UK, people can get bamboozled by the various sources of data out there. Uh, for example, you've got Nationwide, Halifax, uh, Rightmove, Zoopla, the ONS, all churning out numbers on a weekly basis. And you get distorted headlines as a result. And this does often cause confusion within the market because they're all recording different sets of data, um, different elements of uh, different types of housing. Some have time lag, some don't. Um, so we thought it would be a good idea to grab all of that information and put it onto one page. So it's a one page A4 dashboard where we collect all of that data and we, we then send it out to our client base and also people on our mailing list. And the aim of that is because we've been running it now for about three years, we now have trend lines uh, of all those various sources of data. So we can see what, what is Nationwide and Halifax saying and how do they differ and how does that differ from more official data, which comes from the land registry. Um, so it, it is um, a, a view at the moment in time of what the housing market is doing. And again, it does make interesting conversations with clients, potential investors about the sources of data they read it, whether it be City AM, the Daily, the BBC, they all will have a different agenda. Whereas at least what we have is um, the actual data, all of it on one page. That's right. I was just holding it up for people who are watching to see uh, see an illustration of what that looks like. And if you're listening uh, later on, you can subscribe to that by going to. Yep, we can go on to uh, the My Property Consultant website and register your details there and you'll be automatically joined to the mailing list. Or feel free to um, uh, send me an email and just say hello and we'll add you to the list. So uh, plug aside, uh, thank you, Ido. Let's turn to this month's figures because there's just so much going on at the moment and so much uncertainty in both the economy and in house prices, which are inextricably linked, of course. But uh, were there any trends in the September figures? Yeah, so with trends, we've got to start by looking backwards at least three months or so, and you'll actually see a trend graph. Uh, the interesting element which I have to kind of um, highlight is various organizations have different data sets. Um, and again, this is where I was referring to newspapers, newsreels will pick up one set of data, uh, which often doesn't show the full picture. Where I'm going with this is when we look at the nationwide figures, for example, they're showing house prices actually increased 10% over the last 12 months. Um, Halifax are quoting 11.5%. And right move will be quoting 8.2%. And if you look back over the last three or even six months, there has been a general increase in prices over the past 12 months. Uh, what is quite interesting is there can be a big swing in the figures from month to month uh, because the different data sets are based on terms of how they collect the data. 
Uh, Nationwide is the second largest mortgage provider in the UK. The data they release is based upon um, the, the thousands or tens of thousands of properties where they provide mortgages for on a month to month basis. Um, same with Halifax. So Halifax is part of the Lloyds group. Uh, they have three or four different brands offering mortgages. They're currently the number one mortgage provider within the UK, but both sets are um, displaying what their experience has been across the whole of the United Kingdom. Um, so those will actually be the actual sold prices. And when you look at the right move figures, now everyone, um, most people, 95% of people, when you're looking for a house to buy or house to rent, will go to one of the portals. At the moment, right move is the most popular. They quote 95% of people will start their home search on that portal. So what they're displaying is uh, actual um, the actual listed prices. So a house might be on the market for one million pounds. We don't know if it sold for one million and fifty or did it sell for nine hundred thousand. So what they're tracking is the actual um, the advertised prices. So it's very different to actually what did the property sell for. Um, and then the the only official data we do have, which is real data, is um, released by um, the ONS, uh, so the Office of National Statistics, and they get data from the land registry. So each time a property is sold in the UK, that property has to be registered with the land registry. The, Problem with that source of data, there's a three month time lag before figures are actually released. So you have some which are right move, which is like looking into the future. You then have the official data, which is looking into a rear view mirror, but that's the only official statistic we can go on. But again, when we look at the actual trends, the data that they're quoting, ONS are showing that the house price growth is 15% over the last 12 months nationwide. Uh, and in London, that's 9.2%. Um, and those are the official figures, which are higher than what Nationwide, Halifax, and White Roof actually stating. But in the actual Just to trend ask of- a question on that, sorry, yeah. Ido, is what, when is that up to? So it's showing a, a double digit growth, but to what date? Is that July? Uh, it, it is, yeah, there's a three month time lag. So it will be the um, end of June data. So it'd be, mm-hmm. yeah, a three month okay. time lag on the registry data. Okay, so that's interesting. That's interesting context for us to think about when we're looking at the at this particular tracker. That um, there is this time lag, and they don't they don't actually marry. If you're watching live and you've got any questions, please do ask them as we're going along, and we'll try and answer them as we go. Okay, so uh, what um, what are we seeing then? So we're seeing increases across the board uh, with all of the trackers. If I look at them now, they're they're all looking positive to me. The trend lines are, um, are moving upwards with only uh, asking price growth for Greater London seems to be dipping down and uh, as far as the indicators. Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. So the house price growth is still positive um, as registered with the three main indexes, which is yeah the Nationwide Halifax and the Right Move. Uh, but all three of them are starting to say the rate of growth is now starting to slow. So it's not that house prices are decreasing, they're saying that the rate of increase is now slowing down. And we will see that in the ONS data in about three months time. So towards the end of this year, we'll be looking, you know, are those figures actually correct and supported by what is happening when when people are actually buying houses. Um, So when you look at the the ONS data, their figures are reported a lot higher um, I also think about, well, why are they so much higher than the um, Nationwide and Halifax figures? And it depends where the figure point is taken from. So the ONS, we also put the commentary from each of the organizations. The ONS figure is relatively higher than the other indices uh, because when we were in the lockdown, um, transactions of house, housing transactions actually slowed down. There was a, a big dip in house prices all over the UK. And then in May of that year, there was then a stamp duty holiday. And then there's a market frenzy where people started buying property and prices were artificially inflated. And the ONS figure actually picks that up, which is why they're quoting a 15% Mm -hmm. growth over the UK because they're coming from a low starting point, which was during the, the actual lockdown. 
So something like a three month rolling average might be more appropriate to look at um, at the actual growth rather than the, as you say, it can be quite erratic if you're looking at um, year on year type yeah. figures. Yeah. Uh, you also look at the Bank of England mortgage approval rate, which is uh, quite, it's dropped off. It's at minus 14% year on year. Yes. So again, that, that is a direct correlation to what was happening this time 12 months ago. So the mortgage holiday actually came to an end. And as a result, um, sales or purchases of properties did actually slow down quite dramatically when the stamp duty holiday ended. So there's direct correlations when we track back, uh, we can actually see what was actually happening in the marketplace that would have affected market activity. Um, so there's a direct correlation between level of transactions, the number of mortgage applications, and what was actually happening in terms of interest rates or stamp duty at that particular time. Turning to rentals, you also track the home let buy to let index. And what is that first? And what is that telling us at the moment? So um, what's quite interesting, um, a lot of our uh, clients will be investors where they're buying buy to let properties properties where they might live in for one or two years and then they travel overseas, they want to rent their property out. So it's quite interesting to see what is the impact on rental values. Um, so the, uh, the, the figures that we're displaying on the dashboard are um, what is actually happening to rents year on year. It is selected on a monthly basis and we do show the trend lines. And when we look at the rental figures, we'll see that rents nationwide have increased by over 8% over the last 12 months. And in London, rents have increased 10.8% over that 12-month period. Um, we also are seeing we have a lot of networks, I'm sure you do as well, in the kind of the lettings and management side of the business. Um, when we do list properties for rental, we do have over 20, 25 inquiries per property. And, you know, 10 people or 10 sets of people will turn up to each property in the London area, all competing for the same properties. Um, so naturally, because there isn't a high enough supply of rental stock, that has a natural impact that it is pushing rents up. So that's one factor why rents have been increasing over the last 12 months. Mm -hmm. Just that lack of supply. I think there's been a lot of press about landlords leaving the market due to the various government interventions. Is that something that you're seeing as well? Yeah, uh, what has been happening, there's big scare stories in the media where, you know, uh, it's less profitable to be a landlord at the moment just due to the tax changes on the way rental income is actually calculated. Um, there's also the barriers to entry, for example, the 3% surcharge on second homes. But for this serious investor, uh, buy to let properties do actually work, but it is more of a long game. But what landlords have been seeing is their costs, not only as a general public of our costs increasing, as a landlord, we're seeing that interest rates are increasing, the costs of goods and services. So for example, you know, getting a gas safety certificate or any maintenance on that property are all increasing. And uh, these, these increases in prices reflect in the increase in rent. The landlord often will pass these costs on to the tenants. Um, so it's a compound effect of lack of supply, increasing costs within the economy. And unfortunately, that leads to an increase in rental, uh, rental demand as well. Yeah, and as there's so little supply, they're able to uh, pass off quite a bit of that cost. So uh, let's uh, let's change now and look at the current situation. We are in. <laughs> I saw on Twitter today that uh, someone said we're in the seventh unprecedented <laughs> uh, situation that we've been in in the last three years. But um, it, it is really a, a quite a, an interesting time if you take the emotion out of it and look at the economy and what is happening with uh, house prices and the currency. This is really quite, uh, it's quite concerning, is it not? Yeah, it's very concerning, Nicole. Um, we, we've been here before, like, for example, 2008, there's a big market downturn. Uh, the, the main drivers behind the, you know, the downturn, we may expect at the moment, we'll come on to the magic question in terms of what will happen to house prices. But the main drivers at the moment is uh, threefold. Uh, we had the mini budget last week, which we saw changes to the stamp duty. 
or the, the and within the stamp duty changes, there are three main elements that came in. Um, mainly it's attracting or making the, the market more attractive for first-time buyers, which is the bloodline of the housing market. So the actual uh, first-time buyer uh, level at which they pay stamp duty was increased from uh, £300,000 to £425,000. So that means that first-time buyers will not pay anything in terms of stamp duty below £425,000. Um, a, a real example of ours is we're, we're actually buying a property for one of our clients. So it's a one-bedroom flat in the Angel Islington area, valued at £475,000. The stamp duty bill was um, in the region of uh, £7,000. She's making a saving of uh, £6,000, and her stamp bill uh, is actually been reduced to £2,500. So she's happy that she's saving over £6,000 in stamp duty. The second thing that has happened for first-time buyers is the actual uh, the first-time buyer's relief has been increased from £500,000 to £625,000. So in London, the average house price is in excess of £500,000. Um, so first-time buyers often wouldn't qualify for first-time buyer rates. But by increasing that band uh, to £625,000, there's more... Uh, um, uh, reason for first-time buyers to carry on and buy that property. And then the, the third thing which affects all purchasers, uh, all buyers in the UK, is the nil rate band increased from £125,000 to £250,000. And that will affect first-time buyers, um, uh, people moving home, overseas investors. So people will be saving a minimum of £2,500 on their stamp duty bill. So those three elements were the main changes to stamp duty. And the reason the Chancellor did that is they're trying to uh, make sure there's not a dip in housing uh, activity uh, towards the end of the year. So that's the first element that uh, will affect or keep house prices um, relatively high. Uh, the second factor, which is we've seen a lot of uh, media attention this, this week, is uh, the impact of interest rates. Uh, Bank of England are trying to control inflation. And last week, we had the largest uh, increase of in, uh, interest rates by 0.5%. Um, so what that will be doing is a dampening demand. And the frenzy we've had in the media this week is a lot of uh, lenders are pulling rates, um, which is quite normal in when there's volatility in exchange rates and the actual setting of interest rates. So what is happening is the lenders will often... Um, they'll have a daily allowance of how much money they can lend for that day. And normally about lunchtime, they might pull those products and then reprice those products, which normally come live the following working day. Um, so the media is in a way scaring us saying, oh, look, all the lenders have pulled their rates. Yes, 100 lenders did pull their rates. 97 of them put their rates, relisted them the following working day, albeit at a slightly higher interest rate. So that's pretty normal for um, mortgage companies and other lenders to actually tweak their rates on a daily basis. And then the third factor which will affect house prices is also exchange rates. Now, that also has the, the fact of um, overseas buyers. It will create opportunities for overseas buyers or you know people buying goods and services. Um, it's related to interest rates because the bank will try to increase interest rates to stop the pound devaluing any further. Uh, but the headline figure is that the pound sterling is now at uh, $1.07, which is a 37-year low. So it doesn't really affect most of us um, unless you were buying that big house transaction. Um, but that's a 21% drop since January 2022. If you were an overseas buyer or an, a, an expat who wants to come back to the UK, there will be advantages for purchasing property at the moment to take care or to take advantage of market conditions. So in summary, those three, the three parts are the stamp duty changes, uh, the rate of interest and exchange rates will determine what happens um, to house prices going forwards. But the one element which hasn't been answered is the lack of supply of houses on the UK market. In London and the Southeast, it is chronic. There's a chronic shortage of new houses or, or existing properties coming onto the market. And as a buying agent, I'll often turn up to a property which is listed with an estate agent. I'll be one of 20 people trying to buy or secure that property for a client. So demand is still very, very high. 
It, it is. And before we turn to that, I just want to ask a couple of questions on these three points that are impacting the market at the moment. And then we'll turn to your question to Roger. Uh, so first of all, um, you were talking about the exchange rate and how it's at 37 new lows. But how many foreign buyers are we actually seeing and how 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 much support do you think this will actually give to the UK housing market? If that's in fact what we want to do, because of course there's the other side of the coin where people are saying, well, actually our houses are overpriced. They should be more affordable so that more people can get on that housing market. Yeah, so in reality, there, there will be an attraction for um, a, a favorable exchange rate. So if the pound is at a 37 year low, that will attract overseas buyers. Um, there has been a lot of negative media about overseas buyers over the last two, three years. Um, the government have tried to address this by um, making it less uh, attractive to purchase investment properties. Uh, for example, there's a 3% surcharge for anyone that wants to buy um, a property in the UK if they have worldwide property elsewhere. And for overseas buyers, there's an additional 2% uh, if they do not pay tax in the UK. So if a lot of our clients are from Singapore and Hong Kong, uh, they'll be paying an additional 5% stamp duty. So that's a, dis you know, a disincentive for them to purchase within the UK. So the, the actual question in terms of will um, a, a, a low pound actually attract them, it will sway their thinking rather than there be you know, uh, you know, a huge wave of people investing in the UK. What has happened over the last two years due to COVID is international travel is only starting to recover. Um, so when you look at parts of the London market, so the expensive parts of London over 1.5 million pounds, at the moment, their prices are still um, the same as they've been since 2014. So that part of the market hasn't actually recovered. And the, the issue with the dashboard is we're obviously talking about averages, but when you look at specific areas of the housing market, um, each one will have a different correlation in terms of these, these external factors which uh, are affecting them. So I don't think we will have a huge influx uh, of foreign buyers, but if so, that only affects the top end of the market. Um, so I, I do get that what we are trying to do is create um, a fair market for all. And I think this, the way the stamp duty is calculated at the moment, there are enough barriers there to stop people buying properties from overseas unless they're doing it for genuine reasons. Which leads us very well into this question by uh, Roger. Is there still the stamp duty surcharge for additional properties, especially if the stamp duty would otherwise be nil? Yes, there is. Uh, for additional property, if you own property um, anywhere worldwide, uh, when you go uh, uh, and purchase something in the UK, your solicitor will ask you, do you own any properties worldwide? If the answer is yes, you will have to pay an additional 3% on the total value of that property. And if you're an overseas buyer, there's an additional 2% on top, which makes a total of 5% on top of the nil banding in that particular example. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, thanks for that question, Roger. And if anyone else has any questions, please do feel free to ask. I wanted to also just um, perhaps play play devil's advocate here because you said that um, these three main changes to stamp duty will keep house prices high as all buyers will immediately save a minimum of two and a half thousand per property. It's not a huge amount of money. So why do you think that two and a half thousand will or that sort of uh, area of um, saving will provide support for the housing market? Well, the, the main, benef uh, the main uh, beneficiaries of the stamp duty changes are the first-time buyers. Um, the government's quite keen to get the first-time buyers moving in the market. Uh, you then will have the next tier up, which will be people scaling up, because the issue in the UK is people are actually moving up or down. So you might have somebody living in a one-bedroom property, two-bedroom property that want to buy a family home. There's no incentive for them to actually, you know, to actually scale up. So the two and a half thousand pounds, yes, it is uh, relatively low. But if we get the first time buyer activity moving, there will be more properties available and we can start at the bottom of the market and work its way upwards. But I do agree, if you were buying a house, a family home, you know, between 750,000 to a million pounds, 
the two and a half thousand pounds isn't really an incentive for you to move home. Yes, it may cover or go towards your legal costs. So it's it's a factor that will help, but it was designed to actually really bolster the first time buyer market. Okay, let's turn now to uh, your your views, your predictions, and. I think just before you answer that, um, you did touch on it, and this is that in the last market correction in 2008, prices in London fell by 15 to 20%, but rebounded within 18 months and went on to be 75% higher uh, today. And you were talking about the regional differences, and you said here Manchester took eight years to recover from the market correction and Leeds took nine years. So what do you think is going to happen before we then turn to Nima and answer her question? Yeah, so th those are the statistics which we've been collecting um, since inception. And what I believe will happen is the market will flatline, as in prices will not, um, the rate of growth will slow down between now and the end of the year. And over the next 12 months, I believe property prices will remain level um, in terms of average house prices. So I'm not predicting okay. any fall in prices um, or any major increases in prices. Um, it is a quite a critical point in the economy at the moment. Uh, you will have seen that at the moment, you know, the, the uh, Chancellor is trying to encourage housing transactions, but at the same time, the Bank of England is trying to use monetary pressure to control lending. So at the moment, they're working in different directions. Um, in the economy, the wider economy, there's so much debt, which is government debt, as well as personal debt. And the Bank of England yesterday took the initiative to actually offload some of that debt, which, again, what they're trying to do is to calm the market and make sure that interest rates don't spiral out of control. Um, so I think those will be the main drivers behind what will happen to prices. It's no one's they interest. They purchased debt. They actually were purchasing debt yesterday to because if they didn't, uh, there would be a run on the pension funds and the pension funds would not be able to operate correctly. There was a really interesting interview with Mark Carney, the former Bank of England uh, governor, yesterday, uh, this morning, sorry, on Radio 4, and he went into a lot of detail about exactly what happened yesterday in the markets and why. So if I do recommend that you go and have a look at that interview on BBC Sounds and uh and have a listen to what actually happened. It's quite, it's quite concerning. So, Ido, you know, that's a very brave uh, forecast to say that you don't think property prices will fall. So, I'm really interested in in seeing how that plays out for you. We've got two other questions here. First of all, we have Nima. Uh, is the value of flats increasing at the same rate as houses? Good question. What's yeah, the answer? Uh Thanks, Nima. Yeah, it is an interesting question. So again, the dashboard which we produce shows the average prices. Um, there are regional differences. So for example, London and the Southeast will act very differently to you know, northern cities, for example. And then you have new build properties, which will act very differently to old established properties. Um, so the value of flats in general, the turnover of flats is higher than family houses, for example. Um, so uh, I can comment on London and the Southeast because that's where we're currently active. Um, we, we see that the houses will offer more resilience because there'll be family purchases. So people might be buying a family home, uh, somewhere there where people are going to stay for the next 10 years plus. So they're more resilient towards um, any kind of fluctuations in prices. There's less uh, houses that the same number of buyers are competing for. So when we are looking for family houses, you'll find that there's more people looking for family houses, hence the prices are more robust compared to the flats. Um, so there is a, a difference between flats and a different rate for houses as well, but it also would throw in another level of um, complexity, which is actual geography as well. Also, probably the price bands. So you can get houses for 10 million plus, you can get 5 million, 2 million, and sort of under 1 million as well, depending on whereabouts you are, and even less in other parts of the country. And I guess there is a different supply and demand demographic for each of these pricing bands as well. And uh, there'll be a, a different um, yeah, supply and demand strategy for each of those. So yeah, it'd be interesting if you could break it down even further uh, and just really drill down into those um, 
if you didn't have a, another daytime job, I don't, okay. you don't, um, we have one other question here from LinkedIn. If you listening live have any more, we've got a few minutes left where we can answer your question. Someone on LinkedIn is asking, what will trigger a nationwide price correction? Again, a very good question. Um, so uh, we, we were talking about um, what happened in 2008, and we were led to believe that was a financial services-led um, correction. So the banking, cri uh, the banking crisis actually happened in 2008. Uh, we had subprime mortgages. We had lenders actually defaulting on the loans that they had with other banks. So we ha we we're looking at something catastrophic to happen, which will cause a big housing correction. Uh, what's actually happening in 2022 is the different factors. So we have war in Ukraine, which is still part of Europe. Uh, we have rising energy costs, rising inflation throughout the economy. These are all big factors which may trigger um, the rate of growth to slow, but we would need something catastrophic, which I can't see the government or the Bank of England uh, allowing that to happen because there's so much debt within the economy uh, uh, within the government, they're holding a lot of debt as well. Uh, so that's why it feels like everyone is kind of treading on eggshells to make sure that the housing market doesn't slide off a cliff. Just to challenge you perhaps a little there, uh, you know, with, don't we think that the energy crisis, the uh, interest rates, uh, we don't think that this is enough fuel to create uh, a correction? I think volatility um, will settle. So at the moment, we've got volatility in the fuel prices, uh, but we've already seen that oil prices are starting to come down at the fuel pumps. So that will have a deflationary measure on the economy. Uh, we, we've seen that um, the, the, the other aspects to inflation aren't really consumer-led. People that I know, and I'm sure in the general economy, we're not spending lots of money on holidays, new cars, uh, items for households. The, the external factors which are causing inflation, which is yeah, the fuel prices, uh, the general cost, the knock-on effects of that on the increase in the price of goods. Um, so again, it's not um, consumers' fault that inflation is so high. A lot of that comes from the fallout of two years of lockdown where the economy hasn't been uh, working as it should have been. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, you, know, you would have seen a lot of people thought when we went into the lockdown just over two and a half years ago, that may have triggered a big housing correction and it didn't happen. Um, so I, I think, uh, going back to my original stance, mm. prices will re remain level. There'll be some volatility, but with that also comes opportunities. People, we still remember, people need houses to live in. Um, so my advice is if you are moving or you need to move to a family home or you want to buy that property, you need somewhere to live in, you should continue. And we've got to take a long-term view over house prices um, yes, if you were going to buy a property as an investment and want to make money over 12 months, that'd be very difficult to do. But it's like pensions, other investments and property over a period of 10 to 15 years, uh, the value of that asset will increase. And that's when we kind of take a helicopter view on the kind of statistics that we push out. Over the long term, um, the market will um, should be able to deal with any volatility and fluctuations so you've got to think long term as opposed to what's going to happen in the next 12 to 18 months. Yeah, and that comes back to the point you raised earlier about the supply. And the fact remains that like with rental properties, there is just not enough available for people and to meet the, the demand of, of uh, our, our country and those who choose to move here. So uh, is there anything that can be done? Well, it's, it's a very interesting point. The demand for housing in the UK is we need another 80,000 new homes built in London and the southeast every year. And the highest record we've ever had is we've built 26,000 homes in one year in London and the southeast. So there's an immediate shortfall immediately there. So unless we can wrap up housing building to 80,000 new homes a year, this supply-led um, effect will mean that house prices will, over the long term, remain high. The population of London uh, is set also set to increase by 1.2 million people over the next 10 years. These aren't my figures. These are actually ONS figures. They, they model what population is actually going to do. 
So when you look at the second largest city in the UK, it's actually Birmingham. Birmingham has a population of 1.2 million people. London is about 9 million people. So it's equivalent of the whole of Birmingham joining London over the next 10 years. So that also will act as a fuel to hold prices current or to see an increase in prices over the next 10 years. And when we look at back over the last 20, 30 years, I know you'll know people in the property circle, you know, you'll see, you know, a one bedroom property in, in London might have cost £250,000. Over 10 years, it's shot up to £500,000. Over the next 10 years, although people won't believe me that a one bedroom flat might be eight or £900,000, I've actually seen that over the last 20 years, that prices do, in general, they can double quite easily in 10-year cycles. Yeah, definitely. And and again, just to take back to what you say here in your in your newsletter is that it does it matters where you buy and buying in the best location uh, provides some resilience uh, to that uh, buying decision. So if I could summarize uh, very briefly what I believe that you've said and what the numbers are saying, that if you're looking to buy a home, if you can find something that meets your requirements, just buy because longer term there's very little supply and prices may be flat but not necessarily dropping. If you're looking to invest, then longer term, London and the southeast especially, will continue to rise as demand continues to increase and rental demand also increases. So it seems that you're very positive and the only thing that would put a spanner in the works, so to speak, for a rental decision or an investment decision is further major tax changes or government legislation changes uh, towards landlords. Exactly that. And there's also the cost of borrowing. So at the moment, yeah. you know, interest rates are increasing. Um, you know, uh, some people are saying interest rates may hit six or seven percent. But we've got to kind of you know, add some perspective onto that. So when we look at house owners, uh, one third of house owners do not have a mortgage. One third of house owners are on a fixed rate. And um, yet yeah, there's an issue where some of these people may come off those relatively low fixed rates to have a higher rate. And then you'll have um, one third of people which will be on variable rates. So it's those types of people which will be affected by the market. But when you see the headline again saying interest rates are going to hit 6%, it doesn't affect all people within the housing market. Um, so it is um, keep calm, carry on um, and take a long term view you know, to this current situation we're in. That's right. And that's a very good way to end. And just to add that you and I are old enough to remember 17, 18% interest rates, uh, yeah. probably from our family, our, our parents when they borrowed. So we have been spoilt for so long with exceptionally low interest rates that we have benefited from. Uh, Ido, thank you so much for your time. This was the first of many discussions that we're going to have over the coming months. And I think it was a really good first start. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your tracker. And again, if anyone has any further questions, just join in the conversation on the various social media platforms. And we're going to be here next month. I'll let you know the date. Thank you, Ido. That's great. Thanks, Nicole. And thank you to everyone that joined in the discussion. And see you next month. Bye.